watchers should be aware that this presentation may contain sensitive information, images or names of people who have since passed away. So I'm an archeologist by training uh, and a curator, which can lead to some interesting paths. And what started out as sort of a side quest turned out to be a defining moment in how I think about collections and curation. Curation is not just organizing objects and caring for objects does not necessarily mean keeping them in your collection. Today, I'll share the story of consultation and repatriation of ethnographic material to two Aboriginal Australian communities. I'll only be sharing images of objects that are culturally unrestricted, that is, they're available for the public to see, and that the communities have granted permission to view. In October 2019, the Illinois State Museum returned 42 culturally significant objects to the Arenda and Badi Jawi communities in Australia. The museum was the first in the world to do so under the Australian government's Return of Cultural Heritage Project, administered by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, or IATSIS, in Canberra. But before this all happened, we have to go back to December 2018. I was about seven months into my position as Curator of Anthropology at the ISM and received an email from IATSIS inquiring about Aboriginal Australian or Torres Strait Islander material in our collection. This didn't really seem out of the ordinary as we regularly receive emails about our collection from researchers, students, and the general public. This one was a little different though. It asked if we had any protocols for international repatriation and whether we'd be open to returning objects to their communities of origin. While we don't have a formal policy for international repatriation, the museum did return a stolen grave marker to a community in Kenya in 2007, so this wasn't unprecedented. I indicated that yes, we'd be open to talking. To give you a little background on the project, the Return of Cultural Heritage Project ran from 2018 to 2020. It was a two-year grant from the Australian government to IATSIS to facilitate and secure the return of cultural heritage from overseas collect collecting institutions back to Australian First Nations communities to support cultural resurgence and maintenance. Uh, importantly, Everything that was requested to be returned was going directly back to the communities, not to another collecting institution, um, or at least not without uh, the, the permission and um, guidance of Australian First Nations. The project did not include the return of ancestral remains. Uh, this is handled through another government agency. Although objects uh, had been returned to Australian First Nations from institutions within Australia, uh, up to this point, there was no consolidated effort to request return from overseas institutions. So IATSIS went about contacting over 200 such institutions, including the ISM. This wasn't really a cold call, uh, as an IATSIS researcher had published a catalog in 1989 on Australian and Torres Strait Islander heritage held by international collecting institutions. And this publication is what the Return of Cultural Heritage Project staff used as a starting point. At this point, you may be thinking, why does the Illinois State Museum curate material from Australia? And that's a fair question. Although we're now known primarily for telling the story of the land, life, people, and art of Illinois, the museum was formerly a universal museum, one that tried to illustrate life around the globe. Think of a smaller version of the Field Museum in Chicago or the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Prior to the internet or readily accessible research material, the museum was a way for local communities to learn about and engage with other parts of the world. Over time, many public museums became more focused on local and regional topics. This included the Illinois State Museum. The last time any Australian artifacts were on exhibit was 1981. When off exhibit, they have been cared for and stored in our temperature and humidity controlled research and collections facility in Springfield, uh, which is where I work. The 42 objects came uh, and others came to the ISM in 1942 from the University of Chicago via a loan for a rotating exhibit series on international cultures called the Living Map. There's no paper trail indicating why these were never returned to the University of Chicago and why they were accessioned into the ISM permanent collection, but they were. 
This made them the property of the state of Illinois. After talking with IATSA's folks, it became clear that we didn't even know who collected the objects or how they ended up at the University of Chicago. My colleague Claire Martin and I drove to the University of Chicago Archives Special Collections in February of 2019 to pour through the Anthropology Department archival files looking for anything related to Australia. We weren't aware of anyone working in Australia prior to 1942, except perhaps for the social anthropologist Alfred Radcliffe Brown. Although we considered it a possibility that these objects were collected by Radcliffe Brown, we suspected he wouldn't have left his material when he took a position at Oxford in 1937. So at 4.30 p.m., just as we were told to wrap it up and getting, we were getting kicked out of the archives, we found a name that changed the course of our research, Gerhard Lavis. Gerhard Lavis was a graduate student at the University of Chicago and conducted fieldwork among Aboriginal Australian communities between 1929 and 1931. He was mainly on the North and Northwestern coasts, studying and recording six indigenous languages. Although he didn't finish his PhD, his work is extensive and of very high quality and is still used today by linguists and indigenous communities. We found correspondence between Lavis and Faye Cooper Cole, the department chair at the University of Chicago. And on October 4th, 1929, Cole wrote to Lavis regarding the collection of objects from the communities he was working with. Cole said, be sure and gather all you possibly can along these lines. As Claire dove deeper into Lavis's background, we came to find out that Lavis's field notes and other primary documentation are currently housed in the papers of Gerhard Lavis at the IATSIS manuscript collection. Um, so this is our first indication that it is a, a very strangely small world. But this helped greatly uh, with our research going forward with the communities. From the earliest conversations, we were told there may be items of special importance known as secret sacred items to various Aboriginal Australian communities. Based on our inventories of materials, the IATSIS folks easily identified things that could be considered secret, sacred, or restricted. We erred on the side of caution and listened to the communities when in doubt. The request was made for only men to handle and photograph these objects during the identification phase of the project. This was somewhat of a logistical challenge since all the anthropology staff and the museum photographer are women, but we were lucky enough to lure back our former photographer, Doug Carr, who is pictured here photographing um, spears, which are not secret sacred. I assumed this restriction was a sign of respect for Aboriginal culture and because as Western women, we were not initiated to the ceremonies for which the objects were used. These were only part of the reasons for the request. The senior loremen conveyed that the objects are very powerful and they wanted us to be protected. It did not matter if we believed the objects had power or not. Anyone could be affected by their power. At no point were we told the names of the objects or what they were used for, except they were used by men in special ceremony or men's business. It struck me that we are not just caring for objects, but in some cases, something much more powerful. This was illustrated by how the representatives from Aranda and Badi Jawi interacted with the objects while in Springfield. I'll turn now to a brief background on each of these communities. Um, and just for reference, these are two of the uh, body boomerangs that were in our collection that did go back um, to body country. Uh, and the um, you can see the detail uh, in the image on the left. So these are painted with red ochre and then the mineral pigment is um, kaolin, uh, which is a clay uh, mixed with other material. Badi Jawi country is in extreme northwestern Australia in the Kimberley region, uh, in, in this red area known as Cape Levesque. Um, and uh, there are a few communities there, one being um, Argyloon or One Arm Point over here. Um, but as you can see, uh, Broome is the nearest city, um, and it is down uh, here. And then Cape Levesque Road, which I believe is um, just a red dirt road that I'll show you a picture of later. Um, goes all the way out to Cape Lebec. Body are fishers and hunters relying mainly on sea turtle and shellfish. Of note here are the pearl oyster shell ornaments known as Rigi. 
on the top right is Bruce Wigan, an artist who gives tours focusing on Rigi. To the left is a group of body dancers. The dance troupe has traveled all over the world to perform at cultural exchanges. The man in the center is Robert Wigan, um, or Dilli. He is one of the body, um, body senior men who traveled to Springfield. Notice also the traditional raft they're standing on. We actually had a miniature one or a model one of these in the ISM collection. Rigi are not traditionally considered restricted objects. That is, they're used in ceremonies in the public realm. However, some Rigi, including those at the ISM, are restricted based on their designs. These are used in men's private ceremonies. For that reason, the ISM Rigi are not pictured. This photograph of body men was taken in 1917 in Cape Levesque. The men are wearing the pearl uh, Rigi shell pubic ornaments held in place by lengths of hair cordage wrapped around their waists. Uh, some of the men are painted similarly to contemporary body dancers. Here too, uh, in the front, you can see boomerangs, um, some shields and spears, all of which we had examples of in the ISM collection. Working with the return of cultural heritage researchers in Canberra, we were able to identify when Lavis collected the objects from body country and sometimes from whom they were collected. These are actually copies of Lavis's handwritten notes in his notebooks that are stored um, in the manuscript collection at IATSIS. Uh, they describe the objects in the ISM collection such as paddle, shell pendant, shell necklaces, curbed shield, water pitcher, boomerang, spears, and so forth. This slide shows only two of the six pages of material Lavis collected from Badi Jawi. There doesn't seem to be anything untoward uh, in the way that Lavis collected the material or acquired it. He was working with the community for a period, likely asked for it, and it was given to him. Most of the objects are not secret sacred, although a few which are not mentioned on these pages are. Uh, this image is from one of the uh, IATSIS consultation and community engagement trips uh, to body country. Pictured here are body senior men and senior law men, some of whom are rangers. Um, you can see them in their uh, dark blue uh, shirt uniforms here. They monitor the Body Jawi Indigenous Protected Area on Cape Lebec. In the center is uh, Chris Simpson of IATSIS and uh, Russell Davey, who is one of the body men who traveled to Springfield. Arunda country is in the central desert near the area of Alice Springs. So if you look on this uh, map down in the lower right hand corner, you can see the shaded area right smack dab in the central uh, region of Australia is where Arunda country is. Early ethnographic work was carried out here by Baldwin Spencer and F.J. Gillen, focusing on men's rituals and ceremonies. Spencer and Gillen wrote extensively on witchcraft and what came to widely be known as dream time and dreaming. These are extremely complex concepts, but to summarize, dreamings are ancestral beings associated with life forces and creative powers, knowledge of which is on occasion communicated to people by means of dreams. The dreaming and the actions and behavior of the ancestral beings who are in and of themselves dreamings provide models or templates for all human and non-human activity, social behavior, ethics, and morality. Dreaming is found throughout Aboriginal Australia, but perhaps is best known from the studies in Aranda country. All the Aranda materials in the ISM collection were secret sacred, so I will not be showing images or discussing them. Aranda elders believe these should never have left the community as they are so powerful and sacred. Unlike the body Jawi materials, the Aranda material is more difficult to figure out the provenance of. Lavis did not spend any time in Central Desert with the uh, Aranda. He may have purchased or acquired the materials while he was in Sydney or Darwin, but it's also possible they were acquired by Radcliffe Brown during his appointment at the University of Sydney, uh, where he was 1925 to 1931, and then brought them to the University of Chicago. Regardless of the method of acquisition, we took the Aranda Lormen at their word that these should not have left their country. 
In this photo of the senior Lorman, Lorman and apprentice Lorman, um, again, we have Chris Simpson of IATSIS, um, who did the majority of consultation work. Uh, and then uh, Lofty standing um, in the red cap here, and Braden, um, two men over in the black cap, uh, were chosen as the representatives from Aranda country to travel to Springfield. The Aranda and Badi Jawi asked for the unconditional return of a total of 42 objects from the Illinois State Museum, 11 going to the Aranda and 31 to Badi. This required deaccession or formal removal of objects from the collection, since, as I mentioned previously, by accessioning them into our collection, they became um, property of the state of Illinois. As lead curator on the project, I wrote a request to the Museum Board of Directors and presented it along with documentation from IATSIS and formal letters from representatives of the communities. Our board meets quarterly, and they knew the consultation and discussion was ongoing. Deaccession was unanimously approved on September 9th, 2019, only nine months after we started our dialogue. Two representatives from each community and two staff from IATSIS traveled to Springfield in October 2019 to take possession of the artifacts. Um, the visit started with a meeting led by IATSIS staff on cultural competency and respectfully engaging with the Aboriginal delegates. In Australia, the Indigenous concept of country links the land's original inhabitants with the present and recognizes the significant relationship between indigenous people and the land they steward. Welcome to Country is a ceremony that takes place before events in Australia to highlight the cultural significance of the local Aboriginal groups and is often performed by an elder or other spiritual leader. The men indicated they would be more comfortable starting the week of activities with a welcome to country. Fortunately, the ISM has an excellent working relationship with the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma um, as Illinois forms the heart of their homelands. I called Logan Pappenfort, pictured here in purple. Uh, he's the second chief and director of cultural preservation uh, for the Peoria and explained the work we were doing with the Aranda and Badi Jawi and asked if he would welcome them to country. He graciously agreed, driving from Miami, Oklahoma to do so. For the Aranda especially, there was a mixture of sadness and relief. The secret sacred items were returning home. Secret sacred items are not thought of as inanimate objects, but rather as living beings. When the Aranda representatives entered the private space where their objects were laid out, one of the men later told me he heard the items speaking to him. It was the voice not only of the maker, but of everyone who has gone before. The ancestors aren't necessarily within an object, but they could be. The men spoke to and sang to the objects, telling them they were going home. This intimate spiritual exchange was required before any packing of the materials could take place. Packing was done by men with assistance from, excuse me, packing was done by the men with assistance from male ISM staff and emeritus staff, as well as male volunteers. Anyone who worked in proximity to the objects was invited to a smoke ceremony in the morning of the formal handover. This would, in its essence, cleanse us of lingering power of the objects. Uh, and we had this outside right in the backyard of the Research and Collection Center. Um, and you can see pictured from the left to right here um, are Braden from Aranda, Robert from Body, Lofty from Aranda, and Russell from Body. At the handover ceremony, the Australian Aboriginal men shared the importance of this event. Um, on the left here, you can see uh, David Bushby, who is Australia's Consul General in Chicago, who spoke about the return. Um, from the IATSIS final report, um, I'll just share this, uh, this, the meaning of the return um, to the body community. Uh, the body community see the return of the material as a way to teach people about how their ancestors lived, but also how to incorporate these objects into their current cultural practices. They believe that the material will be a significant and crucial part of maintaining and revitalizing body culture now and in the future. There was also a celebration for the return of objects. During the formal handover ceremony, the body men performed a spirit dance. 
Uh, Russell, who is pictured on the bottom here, uh, as well as in the top, showing us some of the boomerangs. Um, he actually played the boomerangs as instruments. Um, they had been sitting silent for nearly 90 years, and um, uh, Robert uh, painted himself in white and danced a spirit dance. Um, so to hear the boomerangs being played after sitting silent for nearly 90 years was very moving. Um, and I had no idea that boomerangs were played in that manner. I don't know that most people in the audience knew that either um, until Russell started playing. Uh, you can view the dance on ISM's YouTube channel and I'll share a link um, at the end uh, in the chat if you want to um, copy it. Descendants of Gerhard Lavis, including his daughter, uh, who's in the center here, um, were able to travel from England for the event. It was emotional for them too, as they were able to see some of the objects their father, grandfather, and great-grandfather had collected. We were fortunate to be joined by George Godfrey um, in the center on the bottom, who is Potawatomi, and he also spoke during the ceremony about the significance of traditional objects to indigenous people, and why they should be considered for return. Um, so throughout this process, it was really, um, it, it was wonderful to be able to connect uh, the uh, indigenous Australian men with uh, indigenous uh, North American men um, and share some of their stories. Claire Martin made 34 custom boxes for the objects to travel. Um, first, we had to determine which objects were traveling to Aranda country and which were traveling to body country. Since all Aranda material was restricted, um, uh, Claire worked closely with, um, or sorry, Claire worked with a, a male volunteer, Tommy Bryden, to create boxes for these objects. The largest spear box was over 10 feet long, um, and it's pictured here in the upper right. Uh, this is the bigger box that you're going to need that the talk refers to in the title. Um, Claire worked with the shipping company to ensure the box uh, would fit their custom crate, which is um, it is being in the process of being crated here. You can see uh, a side of the crate uh, lying flat on the table. This crate would then in turn fit in its allotted space on the cargo plane. So we were limited by the amount of space. Um, we kind of had to work backwards. How much space do we get on the plane? How much, how big can the crate be? How big does the box need to be? Um, Paul Countryman is pictured here. He's our exhibits production chief um, for the Illinois State Museum. And Terry Martin, uh, curator emeritus of anthropology, uh, were on hand to assist with the packing. Um, we also had a couple of men from the packing and shipping company in Chicago um, who uh, understood the assignment well um, and uh, were, were very um, uh, deferential to the, the Australian men's requests. And they were just a pleasure to work with. You can see here on the left uh, some of the rangers um, and uh, Dilai unpacking the spear box in Cape Levesque. Um, and uh, here's just a close up of how those spears were tied to um, this uh, foam material, um, ethafoam, and then uh, inserted into the box so everything would arrive safely. Oops, there we go, a little bit of a delay. Um, so the, the boxes went on, at least the ones going to body country went on a 10,000 mile journey approximately. Um, and upon receiving the boxes in Cape Levesque, um, the body men were very proud of the condition that the objects were in. And they told us they were very thankful for how the museum had cared for them for so many years. Um, the Rangers, again, some of them pictured here, you can see their um, Ranger uniform. Uh, they plan to take the non-restricted objects on a tour of the region and will continue to use the boxes and packing material to do so. Um, so uh, this is just on the, on the top here. Here is um, Cape Levesque Road, um, that red dirt road that I was talking about. Um, and you can see how large the box was um, and it was, uh, it was secured um, to the truck and then driven from Broome, that major city, um, and uh, all the way up to uh, Cape Levesque by IATSA staff. Here are some shields and boomerangs that were returned to body country. 
The men uh, commented on the intricacy of the work and noted that certain designs were essentially an artist showing off his skill um, in, in carving and um, in his artistry um, because they're, they're, you know, they were basically for um, to, to showcase uh, that. Um, there was not necessarily anything um, meaningful behind the designs um, other than uh, they were, they were uh, a way for the artist to show off. And this, um, the previous image, this image and the next image of um, the, this is like the public return, public celebration of the return um, in the community center in uh, Cape Levesque. So this is a really um, amazing story. Uh, this is a, a Kulaman or I believe in body it's called um, Urlada, Urlada. Uh, this was, uh, this is basically a carrying vessel. It was made by the women, two women on the left. It was made by their great grandmother and they are named after her. Um, it's a carrying vessel made from tree bark. And because mainly Western men were the one doing field work, be it social, linguistic um, or otherwise, they interacted more with Aboriginal Australian men, learned about men's business and collected men's items. Women's business and women's items are underrepresented in international collecting institutions as a result. So to learn that we had this women's object, to learn the history behind the object and, and see that it's, um, it's special and connected to these women today um, brought us a lot of joy. This experience really broadened my understanding and vision of curation moving forward. Some things on the list that I put here, um, I already knew, but it really, this whole project really illustrated it for me and brought it to life. First, collections are dynamic and curation does not necessarily mean hoarding. Objects offer, off, excuse me, often enter into curation, but it's rarer that they leave. Of course, deaccession must be a thoughtful and purposeful exercise, but one that can and should be considered nonetheless. Second, materials have agency or power even when they're removed from their cultural context. They're not necessarily static or sleeping or deactivated. Um, this affects how things are treated while in curation and noting that sometimes things are not just things in the Western sense, but they are, um, they are animate, they uh, have an energy or spirit and they are living beings as well. Third, um, repatriation does not necessarily mean losing something. Uh, as an anthropologist, I felt duty bound to return these objects to their communities of origin so they could be put to use teaching younger generations about traditional art. The museum served as stewards for 77 years and it was time to put these objects back out into the world to be used in the proper way. Uh, next, parts of the puzzle may lie in various institutions. I knew this already based on archaeological collections research that I've done, but this was the first time I dealt with it on an international scale. It's good to keep in mind that just because an institution doesn't have key information doesn't mean it isn't out there somewhere. Um, so not only, you know, did Claire and I work closely with IATSIS, um, we also worked with University of Chicago archives, um, which kind of close the loop, um, such as it were, between um, IATSIS and the ISM on the source of these objects. We learn more about the objects being returned than was previously known, and we learn this directly from the community members. So take these shell necklaces as an example. They were recorded in our database as money shell exchange media, which is entirely incorrect. They are in fact necklaces and they are traditionally made by mothers and aunties for boys about to attend an initiation ritual. Creation of these necklaces has slowed since the 1980s um, because that knowledge has been lost as um, the elder generations pass, um, but the practice is being revitalized. The ISM's examples are longer than the ones the women remember. Um, and so these will be used as, as examples for young women who are going to start making the necklaces again. Finally, perhaps one of the most intellectually challenging things I learned is that certain things must go unexplored. Um, they're unknowable. 
by virtue of Lavas being male, interacting with men and collecting men's objects, as I mentioned, women's materials were underrepresented in our collection. Um, but it was not for me or my female colleagues to learn more about the restricted men's objects. That is something we had to lie, rely on our male colleagues um, to do on our behalf. So what's the bigger picture here? Um, the broader impacts, as it were, um, beyond the return of significant objects to their traditional custodians, uh, the Illinois State Museum and the Manchester Museum, uh, who also did a return on, only a few weeks after we did um, in November 2019, our willingness to participate in this project served as proof of concept to the Australian government, affirming that yes, international collecting institutions want to engage in dialogue, consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and return cultural heritage upon request. This led to successful funding of a larger four-year initiative uh, that runs until June 2024. We will continue to communicate with IATSIS about additional Australian material in our collection in the hope of identifying source communities and starting the conversation about whether certain uh, items should go home. So here um, uh, are two reports that were produced um, that are available on the IATSIS website, which I'll share in the uh, chat, um, but you can download these as PDFs. Um, they share some more images of objects going back to their communities, um, not in the Aranda one, um, but in the body one. So you can see um, more images of the return, learn a little bit more um, about the significance of some of the objects um, and see uh, uh, you know, how important they are um, and, and get um, uh, a first person account from community members as well. Um, so here on the, the right hand side, I just listed straight from the website what the new cultural heritage return of cultural heritage initiative um, is trying to do. And it's it's um, basically expanding on the original return of cultural heritage um, project. And that's to facilitate and secure the return of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural heritage materials from overseas directly to the communities in Australia. Two, to enable or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander commun communities to understand where their cultural heritage material is held overseas. Uh, three, to influence the development of changes to institutional repatriation practices, policy, and guidelines. Um, just as a side note, um, there, there really is nothing that um, dictates or facilitates international repatriation besides institutional will. Um, so if an institution is willing uh, to, to transfer uh, ownership and the care of, of objects, then they can, you know, that that's up to the institution. But, um, you know, there are international guidelines on the rights of indigenous people um, from the United Nations, uh, but there, there are no um, international laws governing the return of cultural heritage. And then finally, to foster relationships between overseas collecting institutions and indigenous communities. Um, I contacted um, IATSIS prior to this um, presentation to make sure that I had permission to use photos with community members, images in them. Um, you know, and like I said, I only used images of objects that were considered public. Um, and we're just consider, or excuse me, continuing to foster this relationship of mutual respect. Um, I will send them emails occasionally about things in our collection that we don't know, you know, we need some expert opinion on. And we're going to continue consulting. We have um, objects from other communities communities as well, or we're fairly certain are from other communities as well, um, and, and to talk about the possibility of those um, going back. Um, so I thank all the men uh, who came, Braden, Lofty, Robert, and Russell, um, the IATSA staff as well. Um, they have been absolutely fantastic to work with, and of course the ISM staff and volunteers who made this possible. Um, so thank you all. Um, I will share those links in the chat that I was talking about, and I'll turn it over for um, uh, questions now. Um, let's see, I'm going to stop share, um, and we'll go back 
in um, to the share screen if necessary. Let me, before I get to questions, I'm just gonna um, share a couple links in the chat. Um, doo -doo -doo. Here is um, the YouTube link for the uh, video on the spirit dance that was performed by the body men uh, during the return. There's also a longer version um, that is the entire um, the entire returns handover ceremony was done um, by uh, um, uh, the city of Springfield. Um, they taped it, it's available online and it is linked on the YouTube channel as well. And then here is um, the link to uh, the Return of Cultural Heritage website. Um, and uh, there are, um, uh, the reports on there. You can read more about what the Manchester Museum returned um, and uh, um, the men who traveled to uh, Manchester to receive those items. Um, and uh, yeah, just poke around a bit and learn more about the project. So um, let's see, I've got questions. Um, any other ongoing return programs? Does your budget include resources for this? Um, that's a good question. So there's always ongoing return programs, mainly the being um, our compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act or NAGPRA. Um, and that uh, that covers uh, any Native American human remains, belongings, um, cultural items, uh, um, sacred items, objects of cultural patrimony. Um, and so we we also want to um, uh, make sure that we uh, maintain uh, um, our relationships with tribal nations and, and return things um, through the NAGPRA process. But we are also working on um, an international return of um, uh, memorial markers from Kenya. I did mention that in the talk that um, one was returned in 2006, 2007. Um, that was in our collection. Um, a brief background on, on this um, is that uh, we received a large transfer of African art objects from Illinois State University. And um, these memorial markers were among those. Um, and it came to be known through um, uh, other researchers that one of these had been stolen in the 1980s. Um, and so uh, that was returned to Kenya um, in uh, 2006, 2007. Um, but there's been a big push to return all of them. Um, they are in various collecting institutions in the United States and globally. Um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science did a large return of them to the National Museums of Kenya, who will then work directly with communities in order to get those back to um, where they belong. Uh, they did that um, last year, well, 20, 2019, 2020, 2019, I believe. Um, and so uh, they shared their contacts with us at the National Museums of Kenya. So now we have started conversations um, around um, uh, returning those as well. So um, it is an ongoing process and one that um, if we don't have specific line items in our budget for, um, we make sure that um, you know this is important work that, that does get accomplished. Um, Another question, do you feel it's easier or harder to accomplish intercontinental repatriation than repatriating belongings to native nations of North America? Were these the latest repatriations of indigenous belongings at ISM? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a good question. Um, and one that I've considered a lot um, in terms of being, um, uh, you know, the, a NAGPRA practitioner as well. I think certain aspects of it were easier to accomplish. I won't say the logistics were easier. Um, the, the thank goodness for all the folks handling the logistics um, of, you know, a 10,000 mile journey. But um, because institutional will and um, the bureaucracy of, you know, basically just going through customs and that kind of thing, that's the only thing we needed to be sure of. Um, we did not have to um, so I'll back up and say um, NAGPRA, for those who don't know, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, there are certain steps you have to follow in order to um, be in accord with it. So um, uh, there's all these um, 
these steps you have to follow in terms of creating inventories, of consulting with tribes, of filing a notice, of getting that notice published, of waiting for um, uh, the publication uh, window to close um, for counterclaims, and then you can talk about actually repatriating ancestors and belongings. So there's a process. The process is um, can be um, extended. Uh, and so this, you know, nine months from our original contact from IATSIS to the men coming and claiming their items um, was incredible. I did not think it would happen in nine months. Um, oh, sorry, the links uh, I said to all panelists. Thank you for Meredith, I'll get that. Um, uh, so um, after I answer this question, I'll get that. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so in one way, it was easier. It was more straightforward. Um, and, and uh, you know, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. That's just, um, that that's the way it, it, it worked. Um, but uh, it is not the latest repatriations of um, indigenous belongings. Um, we, are, we are currently doing NAGPRA consultations and have done repatriations within the last year and um, have pending ones as well. So um, we are always trying to um, uh, make sure that, um, uh, you know, we're following not just legal standards, but what is ethically and morally right as well, um, and building relationships with um, Indigenous partners. Um, thank you, Sarah, for, for adding those. Um, uh, let's see. Um, next question is, um, it seems as if strong bonds were made between ISM and body and Aranda communities, as well as IATSIS. Um, could you say more about potential future opportunities to build on those connections or maintain those international ties? Um, sure, yeah, I feel like we had a very, um, very powerful experience. I don't want to, um, I don't want to make it seem um, cheap, but it to me it was almost like um, going to summer camp where it's a very short, intense relationship that you build with folks, um, you know, or, or, you know, attending a conference or a seminar where you're there for several days, you're all working together, eating together, um, you know, listening to each other, um, doing a cultural exchange. It was very, very uh, intense. Um, and uh, we did sort of make those bonds. Um, so potential future opportunities um, to build on those connections, I think some of those would be things like continued information exchange um, about the objects in our collection. Um, and also, um, you know, some of us were invited when it's safe to, to um, visit the communities. Um, and so we'd like to be able to do that. Um, I, it would be wonderful to see some of the objects in their home um, uh, back on country. Um, and um, I think that, um, you know, continuing to uh, reach out to other um, indigenous communities in, in Australia that, um, uh, you know, the, the, all the legwork for that is being done by the IATSA staff and they've been um, terrific getting into um, the indigenous communities um, and building trust and building relationships there. So I say as they continue to, um, to do so, um, then, uh, um, you know, we'll have the opportunity that will open more doors for us to um, share more images um, and, and hopefully build more relationships um, with uh, Aboriginal Australian groups, yes. Um, Philip asks, artifacts, artifacts, artifacts with an I, artifacts with an E. Artifacts with an I um, is the U.S. spelling, artifacts with an E is the British, Australian, Canadian, um, Commonwealth spelling. So same word. Yeah. Um, let's see, I've got one in the chat. Um, this makes me proud to be an Illinoisan. Um, thank you for that. I actually heard the same thing um, from uh, when we uh, we did have a um, um, sort of evening speaker series by Chris Simpson, the IATSA staff member who did a lot of the consultation. He presented and invited um, um, Jason, his um, uh, counterpart um, at, at IATSA as well um, as the uh, indigenous men to give up and give some um, uh, background on where they came from. We heard afterwards this, this, this made people proud to be from Illinois and that was really great to hear. Um, 
any thoughts about whether and how to incorporate more Native women on the U.S. and international side in such exchanges? I understand that most or the most important items were to be handled by men, but it sounds like there were also some women's objects. Um, and U.S. Native women could have participated in some of these events this time. Yeah, so I think that um, the more we know about the objects, um, you know, we didn't know that that was a woman's object until it was back in the community. So it was kind of, um, you know, we just did not know at the time. Um, we were actually under the impression that everything was men's objects um, or at least, um, uh, you know, um, uh, used by men and women um and so how to incorporate um i think that we'll have to be or, or you know one of the one of the um things we can do is to um you know ask when we're doing the consultations if um or i shouldn't say uh, yeah i guess ask if um any of these things are um women's items women's business and should women be involved but this was definitely um uh, this is definitely male focused because again, like I said, those objects are the ones that dominate the international um, collecting institutions um, collections. So I think it's a great idea to get um, the women involved um, and uh, that will be up to the communities as well because they selected who was going to travel for this. So um, yeah, I think continuing moving forward and if we find out we do have um, uh, women's uh, items, objects in our collection, that's definitely something we would look into. Um, and I do want to say that the, um, um, an Indigenous woman did give the welcome to country um, to receive the, the boxed items when they landed um, in Sydney after going through customs. Um, they invited a local woman um, because Sydney's the opposite side of where the body are. So they wanted a welcome to country for the objects as they landed and came out of customs. And so um, a woman was able to do that. So, um, you know, she wasn't um, observing or, or looking at the objects. She was just welcoming all of the objects to country. And so women were involved on the Australian side as well. Um, we have a few more minutes if there's any other questions. Um, anything you wanted me to touch on that I haven't, um, I'm happy to um, happy to, to chat more or we can leave it at that. I will say that um, something I didn't bring up, but um, uh, that was really, um, really great about having the men here in Springfield is that Springfield is um, quite small compared to, you know, other places they they went like Manchester. Um, and uh, it seemed like everyone in the community knew that they were here, or at least, um, you know, so we went to Shields, which is our big outdoor store. Um, they marveled at it. They thought it was awesome. Um, we, you know, made sure to um, show them American consumerism at its finest. Um, and they were appreciative um, of the cultural experience, but um, they were checking out uh, at Shields and um, the cashier was like, oh, uh, uh, you know, where are you from? And they said, Australia. And um, they said, oh, you're here to go to the museum to get your, your artifacts. Um, and the same with uh, going to coffee shops downtown, like you'd bump into someone in the coffee shop of, of course, you recognize their accent immediately and put two and two together. And so it, um, uh, you know, it, it was kind of neat to see that um, the, the wider community um, of Springfield was kind of aware of things that were going on um, around the repatriation. Um, has everything been returned contained in the records internationally? Oh, so is uh, everything in, I see, um, everything in um, Lavis's handwritten records? Um, so we don't have everything that was in his records. I believe that some of that is still in um, Australia because there is a um, uh, there are things that were collected by him that stayed in um, Australian museums. So, um, but from other countries, I don't know that um, uh, that Lavis had anything else uh, that went to other countries. I think they would have only been um, in. Uh, the US. 
um, in Chicago. Um, I might not be answering your question. Um, was it the Lavis records you were talking about, those handwritten records? Um, other countries have definitely um, shown an interest um, uh, and that, um, let's see if I can share my screen again really quickly. Um, I will show um, this slide. So you can see that, you know, um, of the 200 plus um, institutions that they contacted, and this was, you know, this is dated information. They've, you know, this is from the original report that ended in, in 2020. So they've, you know, continued the work. Um, 91 shared information about their collections. So that could mean anything from an inventory list to images to, um, yes, we have, you know, items, um, you know, it, it, it ran the whole gamut. 48 were eager to establish a relationship. Um, and again, that could be, that could mean several things. That could mean, um, yeah, let's talk more, um, let's exchange information. Um, and then 34 expressed an interest to return. Um, and, and the Illinois State Museum and Manchester Museum just happened to be the first two um, that said, yes, we'll move on this. Um, and so there are many others who, who have expressed an interest in returning um, objects to uh, Australian First Nations. Now, different um, institutions have different um, requirements for deaccessioning. Um, for the Illinois State Museum, it just needed to go through our board of directors. But, um, you know, for other institutions in other countries, um, they uh, sometimes need an act of parliament. Um, they will need, um, you know, something way, way on a way grander scale because they are public institutions. So um, in that sense, it was it was fairly straightforward for us to make the case um, for deaccession in other institutions, um, you know, it was uh, um, it it would be a lot harder. But hopefully, that's um, you know they said that they are um, they want to um, uh, improve policy um, and international policy on returns, um, influence the development of changes to institutional repatriation practices. So hopefully, um, you know some good some work will come out of that, um, and maybe some of the more resistant. Um, institutions, you know, I shouldn't say I don't want to characterize any particular institution as resistant because I don't know um, what their um, background is, uh, you know, and there are there may be cases where um, the the institution itself is not resistant, like they, they're willing and they're they're eager, but um, they are bound by um, policies that they they need to reexamine. So um, that's a long way of saying that, um, you know, returns are ongoing. Um, I believe a recent return happened from a museum in Israel. So yes, it's, it's ongoing. And, um, and, and just showing that it's possible and people are willing, I think was a, a big part of this project. Um, and, and the IATSA staff, um, you know, said to us that they, they, when they were here that October, nine months after we started talking, that they can't believe how quickly it happened, that it happened, um, and that that folks are willing. So um, that was really encouraging. All right, well, uh, our time is, is almost up. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, this was recorded, so it will be on the uh, ISM YouTube uh, channel at some point if you would like to share it. Um, I know my Australian friends um, in Canberra, it is 4 a.m. there now, so um, I think they'll be watching later. Um, please feel free to email the organizers if you have any other questions that you would like um, to, to pass on to me. Um, and I'll pass it back to Sarah. So yes, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we hope you enjoyed it.